So I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I speak, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And knowing that this conversation is being watched in every Australian state, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands on which people are watching this. Now tonight we are very privileged to welcome as our guest for this, our very last ZFA conversation for the year, Phil Saunders. Phil is a key part of the organization called Path of Hope and Peace. And you can visit that website clearly after this conversation at P-O-H-A-P, that's pohap.org. Now I don't wanna to say too much about Phil or his organization as he will introduce himself and his work to you. But for those of you who are perched in front of the computer, if you're familiar with Google Maps, uh, and particularly the option in Google Maps where you can look at the satellite photos instead of just the map, it might be worth opening that now because it's handy having a look at where all the towns and villages are that Phil is going to mention. But he also has a map behind him as well, so he might point out where his village is and where the other villages are. Now, speaking to Phil tonight is Adele Stowe Lindner, who is the ZFA's Information Chairperson. And so without further ado, Adele, I will hand the conversation over to you. Thanks, Bren, and welcome, Phil. Um, we, before we get into the um, actual organisation, um, Path of Hope and Peace, um, we've just had a brief chat. So I think it'd be really interesting um, if you'd be able to share a little bit about um, yourself, um, where you're from originally, um what you're trained in and um when you moved to Israel uh why you moved to where you moved to sure thanks very much Adele and good evening everyone Shana Tova from Israel um I am 52 years old and I grew up in London in the Jewish community in northwest London and I was a risk manager in the city a mathematician and uh I always dreamed, though, of living in, uh, in, in the sunshine. I, I was never a great fan of British weather. And so I was always looking for an opportunity uh, to come along to try living somewhere else. And the first one came uh, when I was 30 in 2000 to go and uh, live in Australia. So I got a one year working holiday visa and I went out there and I had a fantastic year. And uh, if the visa hadn't run out, uh, who knows, maybe I'd still be there. But uh, I had to come back, back to London. I, mean, I was looking for the next opportunity and an Israeli girl moved into the room in the apartment that I was living in next door. She moved into the next room and we liked each other. And so, uh, she, she was actually quite happy in London, but I, I, I wanted to try living in Israel, so we, we gave it a try and we moved out in 2005 and haven't come back. And, uh, that's, that's what brought me here 17 years ago. Um, and apart from enjoying the weather every day, what were you doing when you, um, when you got to Israel? Where did you move to? What kind of work were you doing? What was, what was your kind of daily life? Okay, so we started in Tel Aviv, the big cosmopolitan city, uh, the easiest one to adapt to uh, when moving to Israel, especially as I didn't really speak Hebrew at that time. And uh, I was still kind of working as if I was, I was still in England at that time. And I was keen to get involved in uh, peace, uh, peace efforts. Uh, and I live right next to Rabin Square. And so I was there at all the demonstrations, uh, but I didn't yet understand the situation. Tel Aviv, they call it the Tel, Tel Aviv bubble. And so only when I'm uh, eight years later, moved to, to this area and right next to the Green Line and actually got to meet and get to know the Palestinians just at the bottom of the hill, then I really began to understand the reality. And that became so a kind can of- you, um... Can you talk a little bit about, you talk about this area, which I know you know where you live um, and I know where, where I live, but just for the benefit of everyone else, can you just share um, what, what brought you there? Why did you move there um, and, and where exactly do you live? Okay, sure. Okay, so uh, after a few years in Tel Aviv, I felt ready to try living somewhere else. And 
my wife grew up in Jerusalem and she wanted to be closer to her family. Um, and we ended up picking this place, which is right next to the Green Line, just inside. So we're, we're not settlers. Um, and the, on the map here, this, this little house symbol is, is where we live, which is in the white area marked as Israel. Whereas all of this is the West Bank. So this is Jerusalem. And over here are two towns, that dark brown one, that is a, a big Israeli settlement, an ultra-Orthodox settlement, only two miles away from here. And that yellow one is a Palestinian town that I'm most, most uh, linked up with. And so these three towns are the model that we've built of coexistence. Beautiful. So I feel like now we really, now that we know your, your life context, um, we're ready to hear about what exactly you do with um, Path of, of Hope and Peace. So what is it as an organisation? Um, what, what do you do there? How did, if you can share with us a bit about the roots of how it came to be. Sure. Okay. So uh, when, when I got to here, uh, I wanted to go meet the Palestinians. Uh, and it felt natural to me, having grown up in London, a very cosmopolitan city, to want to meet the neighbors. And, uh, and so I ended up uh, at, through some of the connections I'd made in Tel Aviv. Uh, they recommended me to get in contact with a fantastic Palestinian. His name is Ziad and he lives in Fusan, that little yellow town that I just learned on the map. And he has a fascinating life story because he was the Palestinian disciple of uh, the settler rabbi for peace, as they called him, Rabbi Menachem Froman. And, Many things have been inspired uh, from uh, Menachem Froman's vision of peace, which was basically interfaith and sharing the land. And uh, when I arrived and met with Ziad, we clicked instantly. But one of the first things he said to me is, you're a great guy, but please stop talking about two states. I said, what? <laughs> That's everything that I've been campaigning for while I was in Tel Aviv. And, uh, and you don't want that? He said, no, we don't want a wall between us and you guys. We need you. So instantly, my whole mindset was having to be reset uh, to take in this idea, which effectively, from his perspective, he would like to have no borders, one open land. Now, since then, we've been talking about all sorts of things with everyone in the area. Everybody has different ideas. But what began was a project to change the relations between our towns to be coexisting in a, a kind of economic symbiosis. Because at the end of the day, what I discovered fairly quickly is the Palestinians, what they care about most, they said to me, one state, two states, 10 states, we don't care as long as we've got food on the table for our families and we can go to work in dignity and live in our towns without problems. They don't, they don't mind. They're very flexible in that regard. Uh, and so, OK, I said, great, I can, I'd love to be a part of that. But there are periodic incidents of violence that are still happening uh, in our area. And the ultra orthodox in Beta elite they were buying already many things in Husan because they don't have a lot of money and they've got big families and they need to economize. So they were going in there already buying things from the Palestinian uh, business owners, getting their cars fixed, going to the dentist, buying building materials, everything's much cheaper there, even though there was there were periodic uh, space of violence. And I said to Ziad, I said, listen, if you want our town to be involved, we're not going to your town and risk our lives uh, just to save a, few, save a few shekels. Can we deal with the violence in some way? And so see, I said, OK, if that's what it takes, yeah, we'll be happy to, uh, to take that on board. And a transformation then began. And it's a very symbolic transformation because the town of Fusan used to be one of the symbols of violent resistance against Israel. They prided themselves on that. And then for them to switch the whole way and decide to become a symbol of coexistence is an amazing transformation. Transformation, uh, And it began by Ziad speaking to the Imams, because it's a traditional Palestinian Muslim town, and the Imams have a lot of influence. And he asked them if they could start preaching coexistence in the Friday prayers. And they said, yeah, fine. And they then went even further and they 
they started preaching that the adults had to take responsibility for their kids, because usually it's kids that throw rocks just because, I don't know, they, they don't have anything better to do with their time, or maybe they've been indoctrinated. Usually it's, it's not even that. Okay, but they have to understand they're doing damage to the economic relations. And so that's how it began. And then when enough of them had been convinced to start taking this seriously, they began internal patrols, Palestinian run patrols along the fence to make sure nobody could come and throw rocks at the Israelis driving in the road just uh, on the other side of the fence. Uh, and so that stopped everything happening in Hussam. But then we discovered that there were still incidents of violence happening in the area because there were other towns and there are other towns in the area. And that was kind of the place to throw rocks. And, the, and so then we had to request help uh, from the army. And uh, they're the ones with uh, control of the infrastructure. And we requested that they put bright lights uh, and cameras along the road to make sure there was no dark corner where someone could hide and, uh, and throw things at Israeli cars passing by and not be seen. And they did so. And between all that, in 2017, it all stopped. And, uh, and that opened the doors to then start building real coexistence. That is um, a remarkable story. And I'm wondering whether you can, there's a couple of directions I'm interested in. One of them is going back um, that you kind of flippantly just talked about. Well, so he asked the imams, can you start preaching something different? And then they did. Um, is it, I'm wondering if, if in general change, I mean, humans don't seem to change any humans, that is any place. Um, we, we don't like changing that quickly. So I'm wondering what kind of conversations you're guessing um, took place or what may have taken place behind the scenes um, for your friend to be able to start that movement of leadership there because that's really interesting and I think it's instructive to people listening um, who might have their own changes in their own communities um, that they're interested in pursuing. So what do you, did you observe any of those conversations or were you aware from your friend feeding back? So that's one kind of question. And then again, from your um, angle from um, the Israel side, did you find that you had to go about any of that change management from your side to change the expected dynamic in that area? Okay, sure, right, I'll answer that as best I can. Okay, it all was a process, and that's one of the key things I've learned. Change like this doesn't happen overnight, and if you do it in base, where everybody feels the benefits slowly, slowly, then they don't get shocked. <laughs> uh, if you change everything overnight, everybody's suddenly very uncomfortable about it. And so what we, we utilized the fact that there were some people in that town already who had a very much more open-minded perspective. There are five mosques in Busan, and one of them is a Sufi mosque. The Sufis are spiritual uh, Muslims, uh, the, the opposite of literalist, ideological, and so they were very open to the ideas. And Rabbi Froman actually used to call himself a Sufi Jew. And so there was a kind of connection, a spiritual connection between the two religions. Uh, and so we started there. Um, and of course, there were some people who at the beginning were not convinced that this was the right direction. Some of them still believed that the old way of doing things, violent resistance was the best, but not that many at that point, because they tried that and they got very badly punished. The army closed them off all the time. They lost huge amounts of agricultural lands that were then uh, expropriated to Beitar Elite. And Beitar Elite is an expanding city of ultra-Orthodox Jews, who, by the way, aren't ideological. Okay, they're just religious and they're not even Zionist. You see, you see Israeli flags in my town, you don't see them there. So it wasn't about politics there. And for many of the Palestinians in Busan, it wasn't about politics for them either. It was simply, how can we achieve a better quality of life? And that's what you hear from most Palestinians. And I've traveled widely in the West Bank. I haven't been to Gaza, so I can't comment at all on what, how they feel. But my experience is everywhere, 
except perhaps some people in Ramallah are very pragmatic and they're looking for improvements to their lives. Uh, people in Ramallah, many of them are bought into the infrastructure of the Palestinian authorities. So they have very fixed principles, but at most Palestinians are open to things that will make a change that they is tangible. Uh, and uh, so we, uh, we worked with that. And uh, with regard to the Israeli side, I was kind of expecting that I might face all kinds of criticism uh, being a collaborator with the, uh, with the enemy, especially this, uh, this town of terrorists, as, as it was known. Uh, but no, actually, they seem very keen to just see measurable improvements. Uh, in, and the road that we use to get to Jerusalem, the fastest road that we have, goes right past Hussan. And when there were rocks being thrown on that road, we were afraid to use it. And so we'd have to go by a much windier road and they work every day in Jerusalem. So when we managed to get the rock throwing to stop, great, they could, they could now use that road. And it's, it's used so much now that there are, there are traffic jams at, at rush hour now. Uh, so it's very visible, the change, and everybody is benefiting from it. So can you, um, I love the fact that a traffic jam is a cause for celebration for you. It's a, it's a visible output of success. I'm going to really remember that when tomorrow morning, uh, Monday morning, I'm, I'm stuck in a traffic jam. Because so this, this can be a sign for, for peace. Um, can you talk a little bit more um, about the practical, you've talked about the economic symbiosis, and I think that's a great example of you know, people want to get to work quickly. Um, and so that's a very real impact on people's quality of life and the same, you know, people want to be able to work and, and shop and that's a, a, an impact on people's quality of life. Can you talk a little bit about exactly what you do? So what does, how does the organisation, um, can you connect the dots for us of how the organisation firstly came to to be came came alive um and secondly what would it do on a day-to-day -day basis in order to um get your traffic jams going nice and strongly okay so sure okay so we began in 2014 just as a few friends getting to know each other and we called ourselves neighbors for peace at that time and we didn't have any particular agenda apart from just to get to understand each other better but pretty quickly we discovered that there were some issues that needed to be addressed uh, and so we began work we we set ourselves up as an an ngo called path of hope and peace and uh, we began organizing ourselves to actually tackle some of these issues. And at the beginning, it was very much an economics for security agreement, effectively, and purely between the, uh, the local residents, not with the, uh, the leaders of the towns. Uh, it was just, we decided, we wanted to take matters in our own hands. It's complicated to solve these things politically. Uh, to even have an official meeting between the leaders is not possible. OK, uh, to do that because of the politics, but we can meet. And so we decided to start fixing these issues. And so it began by uh, lowering the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the risks of violence and in return, giving economic benefits. And the big, the big success was after in 2007, all the rock throwing stopped, we went to the army and we asked them, can you give them a prize for having made this change? And at the beginning, they said, ah, too early, you know, we're not sure they've really changed their spots. But then at the end of 2018, they suddenly showed up in the town of Sun and posted a big uh, poster in the center, inviting everybody in that town with a black mark on their name. And there were tons of them because they'd all been involved in the intifadas. And once they'd been arrested and spent time in jail. Uh, and by the way, something funny here is that, okay, those Palestinians, most of them had learned their Hebrew in, in jail. And I ended up learning most of my Hebrew from those Palestinians. So that's a, a bizarre way for to learn Hebrew. Um, but they had these black marks on their name and they were invited in October 2018 to come to present their papers. And that day, 200 out of a town of 8,000 received a clean name. Now, that might sound not that much, but actually 200 breadwinners 
uh, is already significant that they can then uh, work in Israel, earn much more money, and uh, and it went on from there. Every year there'd be more and more. For example, the army didn't want to give the young people uh, a clean start yet. They felt angry young men, you can't, can't be sure about them yet, but ones with families. So they gave them first, but now it's moved to the younger generation. And so there's been a process every year of getting stronger and stronger, and the economic benefits for Kusan are very visible. And now I actually, all kinds of restaurants are opening up in there, which is a real sign that they've, they're, they're past the level, level of subsistence and they're now really kind of enjoying life. And, and they've, also, they've also got a lot of independence because they got customers, both Palestinians and Israelis, which means they're not dependent on either one. So they've got one foot in each camp. So it, it's a big win for the town of Hussan. And it's great for us as well, because they're not incentivized to do violence anymore. And, uh, and so we can all enjoy it. And, and we benefit economically as well uh, by buying things in their, in their, in their town or, uh, or employing them as gardeners or uh, renovating our homes, whatever it might be. Uh, but what I want to say is it starts with economics. You can't just do economics. So what we've now done is we view this as a platform for now investing more deeply in real relations. Because if you, if you just do economics, it's kind of like buying a normalization of the reality. But we really want to change the reality. And we want to inspire other areas to try to emulate our model. And we actually believe our model may be an inspiration for solving the conflict as a whole. And uh, if you like, I'll, I'll explain why I believe we here are the perfect test case in a minute, if you like. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the answer, I'm interested whether what you want to say matches my curiosity in listening to you now, that when I was researching your organisation, I saw right at the front of your um, web page of your home page um, before you even click into about or anything like that there's a big um, quote I wrote it down and it said the heart of the solution can be found at the heart of the problem um, and it said it's by um, Rabbi Froman who, who you mentioned a couple of times um, and I the heart of the solution can be found at, found at the heart of the problem I'm just repeating that for other people because I found that um, really thought provoking for lots of different contexts so I'm interested whether that um, angle or attitude um, in the organisation and amongst your circle who started that organisation is related to what you wanted to share about how you feel like this model can contribute to um, changing the reality on the ground for, in other areas. Okay, by all means. Okay, so yes, uh, Rabbi Froman was famous for quite a few quotes. He really, he was ahead of his time. And he, he always said, he said things like, you can't clap without two hands. So you, you can't uh, build peace unless you're both doing it together. And he said, where there's the problem, instead of thinking, right, you've just got to delete the problem or something. No, you can transform it into the solution in some ways. And I think he was, he was referring maybe to two main things religion, which some people think, oh, you know, this is a religious war. And if only we could, I don't know, get rid of, step away from all the religion. Well, this is the holy land. <laughs> okay. You can't delete religion from this land. So you got to work with it. And he was, a, he called himself a Sufi Jew and there are Sufi Muslims, but there's no reason why we can't all, the Abrahamic faiths have a common ancestry and there are so many things that we have in common in our religions so let's use that and the the name of abraham the uh, the and our common ancestor is something that was used recently in the abraham accords so instead of fighting over these things let's utilize them in a positive way and i think the other way he was referring uh, to is the settlers there are many people who believe the settlers are the problem move all the settlers out and uh, uh, and then suddenly we can have peace. And he was a settler rabbi and he was saying, no, no, okay, we can get along really well with our Palestinian neighbors and build relations. And in order to have those positive relations and win-win symbiosis, you actually got to be living in close proximity to each other. And you're saying there's an opportunity in that. So yeah, very much we're inspired by that. And I would add one extra element to it. 
I would say this concept that we are different, some people view as it's a problem. It means that therefore um, there are clashes of identities or whatever. I view it differently. I view that we are complementary, not contradictory. Okay, if we decide to change our mindset and see each other as beneficial to each other in this land and actually cherish each other's presence in this land and see that we all have different gifts to offer each other, then you create a whole that's greater than the sum of the parts. And that's exactly what's happened in this area because President Rivlin, who's not president anymore, but when he started in 2015, he made a famous speech called the Four Tribes speech. He said that there are four tribes in Israel. And as it happens, here in this little miniature version of Israel, we have all four tribes because Tsuradasa, my town, has secular Jews and religious Zionist Jews. Then Beitar elite, just two miles away on the other side of the line, are ultra-Orthodox Jews. And then Hussan are the, are the Arabs between us, four tribes. And what we do is we preserve our identities. We're, we're living in a, in, a, in a joint economic zone, effectively. And we have many things in common, the infrastructure, the environment, we have to work to, uh, to utilize those things together, to share resources or whatever but we're not trying to blend our identities. Even between, the, even if Hussam wasn't there, Suradasa and Beta Elite are very different identities and they don't want to uh, merge. To be honest, Hussam is actually the bridge between these two, because they're more afraid in Beta Elite of, of the influence of someone like me going in with my smartphone and maybe talking to their kids about all kinds of things on the internet they don't want them to see, okay? much easier for them to be uh, friendly with uh, Pal traditional Palestinian Muslims. So it's very interesting and dynamic. And what we do is we keep the identities. So Beit Ovalit is going to stay, Beit Ovalit, a Haredi city, and Suadasa and Hussan are going to stay the way they are. And that means we're not threatened by each other. And what we saw, the big test, was a bit more than a year ago, there was a war in May, uh, when it began in Jerusalem Day, uh, when suddenly rockets uh, flew uh, from Gaza towards Jerusalem, and then it kicked off all kinds of problems, including in, in the mixed cities in Israel, uh, Lod and Akko and Jaffa, uh, and these are all people with Israeli citizenship, and they were attacking each other, whereas here, we weren't because we had a little bit of distance from each other, even though we're Israelis and Palestinians. So you'd expect things to be more intense, but they weren't. And then a month later, we were awarded a prize uh, from an American organization for, uh, for that success. And people have been asking us ever since, OK, what, it is, what is it about your model that was more robust than many of the coexistences that are being built even inside Israel? So, um, yeah. We cherish the differences, and we believe that uh, religion and the settlers can all be things we can use very successfully to build a, a better vision for the future. So do you, like, um, from what I'm hearing in terms of where you, so correct me, but when you were talking about ideas for how you can replicate your model, and I want to hear more about that, would you say that, um, when you talk about we cherish the differences in your area and it sounds like the distance is a like a very tiny amount of distance but it gives everyone a bit of oxygen for their own identities um, and maybe that's one of the rest of part, parts of the recipe one of the ingredients when you compare your area's success in that turbulent time to um, to the other integrated areas um, where, which had kind of suggested that kind of level of coexistence. Is that, how, is that how you would compare yourselves, that you had the distance whereas they were fully integrated? Is that the reason that you feel like you had more success or were there other ingredients? Okay, so, yeah, I would say our added value is that we preserve identities as a key 
fundamental human need. Now, I'm not against the idea of mixed cities, cosmopolitan, all mixing together. In some places, it works great. And where it works great, wonderful. However, it would appear in this land, there are a lot of people who really cherish their identities very strongly. And so we need to be very careful not to try to trample them because people get very defensive. And uh, if they feel they're being watered down, and one of the things that went wrong here in Israel was uh, the, uh, they call it the, the national law, which uh, effectively relegated the Arabic language to be a junior language. That is very significant uh, to somebody's identity. And uh, it caused the, it, the Arabs with Israeli citizenship to suddenly feel like second class citizens. And um, maybe those frustrations then boiled over um, when, when, there was, when there was a war and they saw their, their, their cousins being killed and whatever. So it's really important to maintain the identities and so. We actually have political ideas of how that should be done, uh, because the two state solution was we separate, we preserve our identities, but there's a great big wall possibly between us. OK, that kills the economic symbiosis and all kinds of things that we benefit by being able to have full freedom of movement in this land. Um, when I when I go into the schools on both the Israeli side and the Palestinian side, I see a map on the wall that's basically the same map. I don't see on the Israeli side a map without the West Bank. It's got the West Bank in it. And when I go to the Palestinian school, I see the same map. They call it Palestine instead of Israel. But it's the same map, apart from the fact they don't have the Golan in it. Um, but basically, so both peoples feel connected to the whole land. So rather than cutting it up, which is kind of a lose-lose, because neither side is getting the, everything that they really, truly want, um, let's keep the land together. But let's not merge into one state as if we're one nation, because we're not. We're two peoples with two different identities. So let's preserve the identities and let's create a political arrangement where the two peoples can be self-determining, self-governing, and yet sharing the things that we need to share, like uh, the environment and security is best done together. It already works to some extent, the security coordination. Uh, I think it's the main reason that there haven't been too many terror attacks in recent times, although unfortunately we have been seeing a few recently, but still we have to keep things in perspective. If we think it's the wall that, uh, that uh, protects us, the minute I started meeting the Palestinians, they said, you're kidding yourselves. OK, there are so many holes in the in the fences. and whatever. Sometimes there's not even a fence at all. OK, if we want to kind of get through with a, with a knife in our hand and go stab somebody, it's the easiest thing to do. So the reason they don't do so is it's not in their interest to do so. And it's best for us to create a situation where, OK, we all benefit from having uh, coexistence. And we already have one currency. Uh, let's keep that, OK? We all use the shekel. We're already effectively in one infrastructure. But we don't want to try to, for example, all be uh, governing as one block. We've already got enough problems at forming the Israeli government as it is. If we invited all the Palestinians to be part of that as well, it would probably be a horrific tug of war. So I would suggest we can be politically independent, but live together in this land. And we're working on those ideas. So is that something that you've talked about with other areas, with other towns, either bleeding kind of up and down where you are or um, potentially just in different, in different areas? Great. So I'll, I'll answer honestly. Okay, yes, we are talking to other areas. Uh, and we would need them to lead it in their areas. We don't want to be the ones going there, managing the project. And it's a process. It, it can't happen overnight. We learn. Okay, so personally, I'm very happy to inspire them to start to learn anything they can from, from what we've done. And we're, we're telling people about what we did and asking that they start doing it. And some of them are beginning. Okay. But I'm a bit impatient to wait, I don't know, another 20 years to see the next, the next generation of uh, zones of coexistence. So we're also already putting it out there to people, including politicians and academics, okay, to get them to 
start thinking that maybe there's a different way of doing things. And if we step out of the two-state paradigm and start thinking of a, a more sharing paradigm, a more win-win paradigm, maybe we'll, we'll all get there faster. Mm. Um, and it sounds, I mean, there's a really strong theme in what you're talking about that people need to want it um, and that kind of citizen action um, type of philosophy rather than waiting for leadership to um, to change things. Um, I, I really noticed that you very strongly in the beginning said, look, we were in a situation where the leaders couldn't, for various reasons, speak to one another, but the citizens on the ground um, could do that. And it sounds as if if, that's, if that is the root of your model, that even if you change the language of support that maybe philanthropy or politicians have got to support that type of philosophy and work, that you're really looking for partners in terms of citizens to be able to reach out and build their own relationships in their own areas and to show that they, you know, that they, um, that they want it for themselves. Um, can you, I'm interested always, um, you've talked about your own relationship um, with your friend. Do you have any other, I wouldn't say case studies, but do any stories come to mind um, in terms of relationships that you've seen blossom or you talked about, you know, that um, restaurants have started uh, coming up. Are there, um, I don't know, do you, do you or do your neighbours have favourite places to go? Do you, have you seen, um, it, very often it's just that human, you, you know, you see a little tiny day-to-day -day story and you think, oh, um, like the traffic jam, ah, oh, this seeing this makes me feel like, oh, getting somewhere. Sure, there are tons of them. Um, I, I love the city of Hebron as the, the city of our ancestors. Many people believe that's one of the most complicated cities in this land. But actually, I know some Israelis and Palestinians that get along great uh, get in, in the heart of that conflict. That's, that's the only place where Israelis literally live inside a Palestinian city. And some of them have great relations. I've, uh, I've been there, I've met with them. Uh, there's also in between Hebron and our area, our area is close to Jerusalem and Bethlehem. South of us, halfway to, to Hebron, is the Gush Etzion area. And there's an organization called Roots there. Uh, and they are also inspired by Rabbi Froman. And they are settlers in Gush Etzion. But they have great relations with the town of Beit Umar, which is right next to uh, where they live, and with other Palestinian towns in that area. And their model is more about interfaith peace, and, uh, and they do all kinds of activities together and talk about narratives, whereas our model is more pragmatic, maybe you say, it's been focused on security and economics, and now we're moving into uh, language, learning each other's languages and cultures and sport and these kinds of things. But at the end of the day, again, it's all very complimentary. And I know uh, a doctor in Efrat, uh, his name is Yitzklik, I always love quoting him because he's such an amazing guy. Uh, he has a clinic in, a, in an Israeli settlement, Efrat, which he opens periodically to Palestinians, especially kids. I've personally taken Palestinian kids to his clinic to be diagnosed by specialist doctors because they just can't get specialist doctors in the West Bank. Any doctor worth their salt who is actually a specialist wouldn't work in the West Bank, he would get paid nothing. So he ends up working either in Jerusalem or, or in Jordan where they get paid much more, which means they just don't get access to these services. So this, this doctor is an amazing guy who offers those services to fill the gap. And by the way, he's the brother of Yehuda Glick, who is a controversial politician. But nevertheless, there's all kinds of linkages and things are not black or white at all. Everywhere I've been, I found people that we can work with and yeah, I'm really, we're at the stage now where we are looking for partnerships with other organizations who will join in this. Uh, first of all, we need to all work together, okay? Not just at the local level towns, we need to get different peace organizations working together, even if we don't necessarily agree on the model totally. By working together, there's uh, strength, in a collective uh, strength of numbers and, uh, yeah, I would like to see in the end that by forming that collective strength in the end, we will inspire the politicians because let's 
talk honestly, the politicians are mostly focused on safeguarding their seats, okay, and, and their own little party lines. And in, on the Israeli side, we have so many parties, okay. Uh, uh, each of them has got their own little mini interests, and obviously everybody's now preparing up for the next election, and we keep on having more and more elections. And look, I'm not looking for the solution to come that suddenly there's going to be a government that's going to solve everything. I think we need to actually suggest to them a new paradigm, a new way of thinking. And we could really do with support from the international community as well, okay, in opening uh, everybody's minds to these uh, possibilities. So yeah, at the end of the day, we want to create a lobby for positive coexistence in this land, rather than just forming another political party or something and then just becoming another part of the problem, maybe. I'm really interested um, in all these stories that I just was like, can you just share us one story? And you're like, and there's this one, and there's this one, and there's this one. And I, I get the feeling that actually they're the tip of the iceberg. And then if I ask you again tomorrow or the next day, you'll have five and 10 more different examples. And I'm just wondering what your reflection is about why that's not the narrative that everyone hears about. There's so many stories on the ground. Why are they not? Um, taking up all the pages in the newspaper each day. Okay, so the truth of the matter is they're all people, okay, the vast majority of people are quite simple people who don't have the faintest idea what kind of future they're hoping for, they hate politics, the Palestinians do not like the Palestinian Authority. <laughs> it's well known that the, the PA is not popular. Unfortunately, they've learned that Hamas are no better. In 2006, they had an election and they dared to hope that a religious party might be more principled. Well, we saw what happened in Gaza. And the, so they don't know the, which way to go. Uh, they're mostly looking towards us to be the inspiration and lead the change, because at the end of the day, the power is mostly in our hands. Uh, and uh, yeah, most people just want to be able to live their lives in this land, okay, with their identities and whatever, and they're the things that are important to them. Um, but they could be open to all kinds of solutions. And so we're working on solutions that would match uh, these things. And so you asked, why aren't you hearing about it on the news? Uh, I'm afraid. Peace isn't as sexy as, uh, as, as conflict and violence. And, uh, you know, the media is naturally going to gravitate to every, every spot of uh, where things are blowing up. Okay, so yeah, you'd get the impression that, you know, we're living in a war zone all the time. We're not. Okay, I've been everywhere, apart from Gaza, well, I said I can't go there. Okay, but I've been everywhere else, uh, including some places I'm not supposed to go. Okay, but it doesn't matter. If you go with friends and whatever, everything's fine. I've been welcomed as an honored guest by Palestinians everywhere I've been. And uh, yeah, uh, everything is much more possible and there are much better relations than you would believe by watching the news because you're getting a skewed perspective, unfortunately. I feel like you're so, the kind of overwhelming impact on me is your optimism. And I, and I love how you speak so convincingly about this is just all pragmatic. This is about people wanting to live their life. We, we do, you know, economics and sport and, you know, that's language. We, we're about pragmatics. Um, but I feel that the, um, it sounds to me like a coalition of optimistic people. Um, and I and I I wonder how if that's the part that needs to spread um, that optimism because I also understand that there are people in Israel who are not you in your in your circle and in your area who don't actually as you started off with who who don't feel that empathetically towards their neighbours and and don't necessarily feel they have a right. Um, to exist or to be there and similarly there are people amongst your neighbours like in you know there are Palestinians who, who feel the same way about Israel and so I'm wondering um, how do you feel like that sense of, of optimism that you share um, amongst the people your, your partners how how do you feel knowing that there are other people who either are 
more a pessimistic or who um, whose attitudes don't support um, the type of work you're doing? Okay, by all means, great question. So yeah, I am an optimist. Uh, we called ourselves Path of Hope and Peace because we want there to be a possibility that people will have hope for peace. And the reason we have hope for peace is we are living in an area where we see it on a daily basis. We can see all the all the benefits. And as I said, even the traffic jams are a sign of success. Um, so obviously we're optimistic and we believe that, yes, if it could work here, especially with a town that was that prided itself on being the symbol of resistance against Israel, then why, why wouldn't it be possible with any of the other towns? But yes, you're absolutely right. There's plenty of people who haven't experienced it, don't see it on a daily basis, are deeply pessimistic because of all the endless uh, false dawns that we've had across the years. And skepticism is huge. I can tell you, Israelis are deeply skeptical. Okay, And they just don't believe there can ever be a solution to this. We've been fighting for thousands of years already. We'll be fighting for thousands of years more. It's the, that's what it is. Mala sort, they say, what can you do? And I'm like, yeah, come on, come on, let's, let's do something about this. But, you know, you've really got to kind of convince them that there is something that can be done. And, you know, they say things like, ah, oh, but there, there's no partner. I say, listen, if you're talking about the Palestinian Authority, maybe you're right. OK, but, you know, there are other people we can work with where we can really do things. And so, yeah, we are mobilizing people to see this. We are now at the stage of putting ourselves out there. That's why we're happy to now be interviewed. And by the way, uh, until very recently, we weren't because we knew we were building something that was a bit vulnerable uh, at the beginning. There are spoilers who would like to wreck this kind of coexistence. And they're all right now. At the moment, the, the West Bank is beginning to boil over. And uh, yeah, we're under threat. Okay, but we are holding things together. And, uh, and it's really important that we hold this proof of, uh, of, uh, of coexistence that people can come and visit. And tons of people have been coming during the pandemic. And we were very op opportunistic in that because Israelis couldn't fly abroad like usual. So uh, see, I'd had the idea, hey, we've got beautiful natural springs in our town. And instead of just Israelis coming into the main shopping street and buying all the stuff, why don't we invite Israelis to come and uh, experience uh, the nature, natural side? And so a few came and then and then they went and had the most amazing time. And then they told their friends and family. And then it got featured on Channel 12 News. And then there were there were busloads coming every weekend. And Zia had to rope in all his brothers and cousins to be uh, uh, leading them around and showing them. It. And so... Absolutely, it's a, it's something that you can do. And every time somebody experiences something like that, even if they only experience it once, it will change their mindset. And so we are working on that. Okay, we want as many people to come as it, but we yes, we want it replicated, and we want to inspire a change in the in the whole land. And so we. We're now, Path of Open Peace is now part of an organization called Challenge, uh, which I'm now the chairman of Challenge because we've effectively brought our ideas together. Challenge is a conflict transformation organization with theory of all the tools and they, we do workshops and, uh, I, and by adding something tangible, some uh, proof of actually a test bed on the ground for putting those action, those theories into practice, Fantastic, you get a much stronger model. So we've built the challenge and we've also created a project in challenge called the Federal Forum, because there are many people who've been working on ideas that are in between two states and one states so that are federal, kind of two to one. And uh, so we gathered them all together to get them to all start working together uh, because they're all kind of working on their little models in their own separate silos. Again, let's get together and let's develop these ideas together. And so, so now within Challenge, we have the Federal Forum is effectively top-down conflict transformation from the political level. Hopefully we will influence the politicians in due course. We have the Path of Open Peace, which is the bottom-up, the grassroots coexistence building on the ground. And then we have the workshops and academic theories and whatever else, which are more middle out, uh, spreading the ideas. And, and we've, worked, we've brought it all together into one organization. So yeah, we, we really want to uh, lead, trailblaze. Uh, so, um, 
Um, let me know if you don't have don't want to answer this question. Um, but I think something that always interests me about leaders, even when it's leaders who say we're just citizens, we're not the leaders, but it sounds to me that you really have a really strong leadership role and certainly what you've been saying in terms of um, joining together and, and, and bringing challenge in and bringing those tools. Would you have anything you would be willing to share in terms of your reflections, especially at this time of year, on any failures that you feel like you've had in terms of, look, we tried this and then we learned um, it didn't work. So any, any learnings that you would be happy to share um, particularly your failures and learnings, but any other learnings you'd be happy to share that, that you tried and that you think, yep, this, this is actually the thing that, that actually we learned would work. Sure. Oh, we, we've tried all kinds of things and not all of them have, uh, have worked out. Uh, at one point, we tried an agricultural business, the idea of Israelis and Palestinians growing vegetables together and then, and then selling them in Israel where you get paid much more. And it turns out agriculture is more complicated than I, I anticipated. Uh, and the prices go up and down crazily. It was incredibly hard to budget. Everything. In the end, we realized this is too much headache, so we dropped that one. And uh, then there was another thing we did when uh, the Palestinians have wonderful food, makluba, majadara, all these, all these dishes that I'd never heard of before I moved to this area. And, uh, and so, hey, okay, uh, Israelis sometimes want to buy, the, buy this Palestinian food and even have it for Friday night dinner or whatever. And by the way, we, we once did a sukkot shalom uh, where we did kosher makluba and invited religious Jews in Sukkot to come to the Sukkot, which was in Husam. Uh, and, uh, and we had a rabbi come. He, he, we bought the chickens in Beit Elite, so they were kosher chickens. We bought the pots and, and, and made them kosher with the rabbi, and then took them into the Palestinian town, Husam, and Ziad's wife, uh, then cooked it. He, the rabbi lit the, lit the fire, because that's another part of the, and then produced kosher chicken makluba, which uh, I think was the first time that's ever been done. Now, these like this kind of food. So we decided we'd set up a kind of business where every Friday we would uh, uh, deliver the, uh, the food to, uh, to everybody. And at the beginning, there was tons of demand for it and it was great. But then, you know what, it kind of, uh, after a while, uh, the novelty wore off and then we realized, okay, we're not getting enough demand anymore. Maybe we'll need to widen, uh, widen the products or whatever. So again, we put that on ice for now. But who knows, we'll start it up again at some point. Any, so I'm not suggesting that everything we've done has instantly been a success. Uh, not at all, but if you keep working at things, Something needs to pay off. Thank you. That's um that's really fan fascinating, and I feel like it's really generous of you. Again, I, it's really interesting that I just kind of throw a word out there, like what hasn't worked. You're like, oh my god, we've tried this and this and this and this. Um, and I can really hear strongly that um perseverance that you've got going in terms of the um um the cycle of, of program design, essentially, that you're really willing to try things out to that innovation that I think um, that area and particularly Israel is so known for in terms of being, you can only innovate if you're ready to see something fail um, and try and do something differently. And so it's got a real flavor, a really Israeli flavor about um, the type of work that you're doing. Um, is this something you've talked a lot about visiting? You, do, are you experiencing a lot of diaspora visitors, either from the um, the Jewish diaspora or the Palestinian diaspora? Is there a lot of interest um, from outside the area in coming to visit, do you feel? Sure, we get visitors all the time. Uh, well, since, since we've opened up again after the pandemic, uh, and yeah, we welcome everybody and we want them to come and we, we've got lots of connections uh, abroad now uh, and really we, we need support from people uh, from abroad for lots of reasons, okay, because we really, we, we need the, the world to start thinking about this paradigm and help us because honestly, I think sometimes it's, uh, you know, right now, Biden is once again firmly saying it's the two-state solution and Lapid ended up going there and 
and paying homage to the idea effectively when I know for a fact in reality that's not exactly how he he believes uh, things should be but you know it's America we've got to we got to tell them that they, what they want to hear and unfortunately the international community can sometimes with all the best interests I genuinely believe that they have good interests at heart most of them anyway okay but they may be having their own mindsets um and United Nations for example uh you know, they, they think when there's a problem like in Sudan, OK, you've got you've got arrows in the north and, um, and black Africans in the south. OK, let's just cut it into two and that will solve all the problems. Well, it didn't. South Sudan ended up descending into a horrific civil war. And, you know, so that's not the solution always. So let's let's work with what we're saying here on the ground. Uh, better ways of solving the problems and we'd really like to get obviously the the Jewish diaspora on board with us and there's a big disconnect at the moment especially with the uh, the Jewish diaspora in America and Israeli Jews really don't seem to be understanding each other at all right now I don't know what the situation is in Australia maybe it's more more mixed I hope uh, but uh, yeah, we, we really need to start engaging better and understanding each other better just within the uh, the, Jew the global Jewish community. Uh, but also, we've got to reach out to the whole world. Uh, and, uh, Do you feel like, we've only got a couple of minutes, but um, what you just said throws us in a whole different direction that I'm really interested in. Do you feel like you're, what you're offering in terms of a perspective on life and the reality that you've created on the ground is a way in for um, some American Jewry to, to reconnect with the area, to find their way of, um, of connecting and, and enjoying what they're saying? Yeah, I believe so. Okay, I think I understand the way I've had many conversations with them. I understand the way they're looking at things and they really, they're most upset about many things that they see that are going on. They may, may again be getting a biased perspective based on what they see on the news. But if we can find a solution that really works for everybody, okay, there's a win-win out there where everybody can get what they need. I don't believe in compromise uh i don't like that word very much okay for me when you're compromising it means you're yeah all right i'm willing to give up this just so that i don't think that's the right attitude in this land we haven't had to do that in in this area so let's you know let's let's give all of us what we yeah of course we want all the principles of human rights and uh, and freedoms and dignity and democracy the palestinians by the way are dying for democracy okay they don't really know how to get it at the moment okay they feel very stuck and very frustrated but they really want it so yeah we can have all of these western values but also keep the eastern values too it's not one or the other okay this this is the place where east meets west okay where three continents meet and uh yeah you know we, we're gonna have something that is uh, a combination can i ask you and briefly again i feel very fortunate i'm the one who gets to ask the question do you um because uh, there are a few questions of, of people who are kind of engaging and interested i feel you're talking very much about this is a place of not compromising and this is a, an east meets west and three continents there's such opportunity to, to be offended um and i've listened very carefully to your language and i'm wondering if you've got a couple of minutes left to share with us there's a lot of talk about being offended in general we we have a very easily at the moment with language and i'm wondering whether you have found um have you had to forego you and your friends and your community have there been times where people stumbled awkwardly into using the wrong words or the wrong language where you've seen that moment of someone having to forego offense or you having to think oh that's a bit cringy but that's all good like i get where that's coming from okay so the short answer is no okay in when i lived in the uk there were all kinds of rules on what you're allowed to say and do and uh, uh, formalities. When I moved to Australia, I actually found it very liberating that uh, you, could, you could speak much more openly, I found, with Australians. And here in Israel, okay, Israelis speak very directly with each other and are used to it. And the Palestinians too, they say dugri is the word. 
they want to have it straight <laughs> okay uh, and so yeah i haven't really encountered that problem and like i said i haven't actually i've been surprised i thought you know doing this would be very controversial and there'll be all kinds of people against it turns out they're not okay i maybe it's just because of the way we're doing it we're not against anybody we're just for working together living together uh, having a great quality of life in this land and whatever so we're really not against anybody and so as it happens yeah, I, I don't think anybody's against what we're doing, or I haven't suffered it anyway. That's all I can say. Thank you, Phil, so much. I feel like you rounded us off um, in terms of such a positive note. No one's against what we're doing. We're, we're not against anything. We're for something. Bren, on that note, I'm passing back to you. Thank you very much. Um, and happily, you've given me um, all of 10 seconds to uh, to wind up. But Phil um, and Adele, it was so wonderful hearing from the two of you. Phil, I feel that this conversation could have lasted another hour. And so sorry to cut you off. But um, the work that you are doing um, is so hopeful. Clearly, there are setbacks. Clearly, there are people on both sides who don't actually want peace with the Palestinians or the Israelis. But but you are proof that there are people on both sides who do want peace. and. And you're doing it uh, by rolling up your sleeves and getting your hands dirty and just just doing peace. And it's it was it's it was just inspiring and wonderful to to hear from you. So thank you very very much. Um, we at the ZFA uh, this will be the last ZFA conversation for the year. We are gearing up for our ZFA biennial conference on the 30th of October, which we are very much looking forward to. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure uh, you will all hear something about that in the coming weeks. Um, so I really think it's just uh, for me to say hugs and uh, and Shavua Tov and um, stay safe. Have a wonderful week, everybody. Okay, and thank you so much. Hugs and to everyone. Shana Tova. Hugs and Thank you, Israel.